Hey, everybody, we're just going to wait uh, one more minute just to let people come into the into the meeting. So in the interest in time, we are going to get started. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to What's Next, Helping Our Kids Transition into the New Normal. My name is Katherine Ferrara. I'm the Program Coordinator for the uh, Bedford, Lewisboro, Pond Ridge Drug Abuse Prevention Council. We're a group which aims to raise awareness about substance use and mental health struggles and the different risk and protective factors associated with both. So if you'd like to learn a bit more about what we do or the resources we have available to the community, you can visit our website at the DAPC.org. We're very proud to collaborate on tonight's program with the Bedford Playhouse. We have Dan Friedman from the Playhouse here with us tonight. Hey, Catherine. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, so I wanted to say quickly, I um, want to thank everybody um, in the community for their support. Um, the Playhouse is now reopen. Uh, we've got first run movies and a whole host of additional uh, really cool programs coming up over the next uh, couple of months, especially outdoors. Um, we've got some great live music um, and other, other types of programming. Um, so I wanna just invite everybody, uh, if you're so inclined to check out our website, which is bedfordplayhouse.org. Um, it's a brand new website, so be a little patient with us, um, but you can list, you'll, you'll see a list of all the uh, upcoming programs. And I wanna call out just two highlights that we have coming uh, at the end of this month. Uh, on July 31st, we have uh, Lawn Chair Theater is coming back to do a show called A Midsummer Night's Queen, um, which is exactly what it says. It's Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream with the music of Queen interspersed into it. Uh, and then on August 6th, we have live comedy, the return of live comedy, uh, which we're going to be doing outdoors also. Both those programs are outdoors. Um, and we're very happy to collaborate on the Let's Talk program. Uh, it's part of our mission uh, ongoing. Uh, to do these things uh, for the community in appreciation for everything that we do. Um, Catherine does a really great job with everything she does. And uh, thank you for taking some time out tonight to join us for this. It's going to be a great program. Thanks so much, Dan. So just a couple of quick housekeeping issues before we begin. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Any questions you have, you can type them in there and we'll have our presenters answer them um, during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. We also just want to remind the audience that the content of tonight's program is not intended to be a substitute for professional help or diagnosis or treatment. If you or a family member need assistance finding a qualified health provider to address an issue with substance use or mental health, please contact your physician. And you could also email the DAPC at the DAPC at gmail.com and we'll be happy to provide a list of some of the local treatment providers. So as Dan mentioned, tonight's program is part of the Let's Talk series, which deals with a variety of topics pertaining to mental health and substance use. So we have a brief video to just tell you a bit more about the series that I'll share with everyone now. Sometimes I think pediatricians struggle, people with substance use disorders struggle to involve family. And we know that nobody can change in isolation. And you know, that does something to your life when you don't pay your bills, when you're away from your family, when you're socially disconnected. The more we can talk with each other, not professional to patient, but uh, human being to human being. But doing something with that notion of, I'm gonna be chilling a little bit. Having parents not tell kids what to do, but to ask them, what well, what are you thinking? So hopefully that was able to tell you a bit more about the series as a whole. 
Now I'd like to introduce our presenters. We have Dr. B. Hibbs, a family psychologist who has held faculty positions for more than 15 years in graduate programs for psychologists and marital and family therapists. We also have Dr. Anthony Rustain, a nationally recognized expert in child and adolescent psychology, a professor of psychiatry and pediatrics and the chair of psychiatry and behavioral health at Cooper University Healthcare. They are also co-authors of the book, The Stress Years of Their Lives, Helping Your Kid Survive and Thrive During Their College Years. We're so excited to have them here tonight. So without further ado, I give you Dr. B. Hibbs and Dr. Anthony Rustain. Hey, thank you. I'm waiting to see Dr. Hibbs' face too. <laughs> Hi there. Catherine, thanks so much for introducing us. We're happy to be here with you this evening. And uh, Tony and I are gonna give a brief presentation and then uh, welcome you know, your questions. Uh, we wanted just to begin by telling you a little bit about how we got together to write the stressed years of their lives. Um, my son, my, young, my older son, uh, had a, a very serious depression during his freshman year of college. And I, you know, was fortunate enough to be able to get Dr. Rustain to treat him. And along, you know, the course of his treatment, which was about, um, probably about two years, um, I joined my son, who in the book is called Jensen. Uh, and Tony and I share a family systems orientation. And so I found that really, really helpful just to understand that parents are really important in the process of a young adult's recovery. And during that time, uh, Tony and I decided, hey, why don't we write a book? And my older son gave his permission in the typical way he, did, he does, which is to say, why would anyone want to read that? It's so depressing. <laughs> and I said, because you, you got better, like it, it's a, you know, it, it'll help other people. So let me ask Tony if he'll give his input before we begin the, the slides. Well, no, just to say that we had a great time coming up and giving a presentation at the Harvey School, uh, you know, in the fall, I believe, of 2019, before the pandemic arrived. Um, and, you know, we, we've been going around the country at, up to that point. Uh, talking with parents and with teachers and and with other other professionals and we really love the interaction that we've gotten because you know one of the goals of this book was not just to have people read it but to really use it as a springboard for discussion because just like the video said you know there are things we need to talk about we all need to share what we're going through with one another and you know parents Parents, especially nowadays, are especially burdened with a lot of responsibilities that, um, you know, weren't anticipated, especially now with the, with the pandemic. So I think B and I really wanted to participate in this workshop with you all because we think that this is an important time where, you know, we're moving sort of to a different phase of the pandemic and a lot of things are coming up and, and we want to share our, our, our understanding of that and also, you know, hear from you about your, your questions and your concerns. Thanks, Tony. Catherine, could you begin the first slide? So as we were thinking about updating this for the COVID era, we thought, well, what, what is normal? What's going to be normal? And one, one of my clients said, well, normal is the setting on a dryer. She was quoting a movie character. Tony and I decided, well, actually what's going to be normal is tolerating uncertainty. And so part of what we want to talk about this evening is um, how people can best tolerate uncertainty and also to remind you that uncertainty has always been part of our lives. It's just that we're very aware in, a, in an incredibly poignant, sad and different way about the, the things that we used to think were certain and, and take for granted, in, including how could we have a pandemic. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, stress in America in the COVID era. And while the, the photograph, um, is your child emotionally ready for college, is a, a, from an article that we wrote for the Wall Street Journal in 2019, what we're really talking about is, uh, is your child really emotionally ready to go back to school? Uh, whether it's college or high school or middle school. And certainly this includes what has been going on and predated COVID, which is, was the mental health crisis uh, that had seen rapidly accelerating numbers of uh, kids reporting high levels of anxiety and depression from really from teenage years, mid teenage years on into their 20s. And in addition to that, what were the effects on parents, educators, and how did they respond to their worries about their children as well as what kind of strategies they found might be helpful? And then we welcome your questions and answers as, you know, as we're going forward um, at, after our presentation. We wanted, I want to set the context a, a bit um, historically, but also help you recognize that, you know, just newsflash, Vanessa just told me this evening, right as we went on, that California has just instituted a mask mandate again. And so part of what we're going to be going through, we've seen it in different countries, sadly, with the Delta variant, uh, are lots of uncertainties. There's, so there's on the one hand, some relief that we've gotten through in the United States, um, many states are more vaccinated than not, but some aren't. And as kids return to classrooms, some will be vaccinated, some won't. And, and so there's, there's still this sense of like, are we safe in terms of our physical well being? And then again, we're going to talk about like, what were the other uncertainties that we just kind of took for granted and what maybe can we learn from this period of uncertainty. So if, if you if we can go to the next slide, Catherine, I want to just remind people that pre COVID, we were in a period a historical swerve of rapid social change. And part of that came with self branding by teenagers because of the advent of social media um, and the also just constant pressure, harsher competition, globalization, a sense of constant striving in the Gen Z and millennial age groups of constant striving and yet really an uncertainty about like, what will my future be? And if I make a misstep, won't, won't, you know, won't that spell ruin? And so an enormous amount of pressure that uh, teens were putting on themselves and parents were putting on themselves in order to introduce many, many, many activities and, you know, kind of CD packing and uh, that sort of thing. But one of the problems then uh, is for parents, anyhow, as their anxiety went up, what happens in these parental eras of anxiety, historical eras, is that parents exert more control. And what happens then is that children have less independence, less chances to practice autonomy. And yet it's autonomy that children need in order to be able to jet Kind of, kind of launch into not only college away from home, but also the adult world, because this is the world that they're inheriting in which they have to be autonomous. So anxiety in the COVID era, COVID-19 era, uh, really was on top of a baseline of, of a civic culture. We certainly saw that in politics and in many areas uh, where there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of fear, enormous uncertainty, and that kind of affect leads to cognitive distortions. In other words, kind of fearing the worst, thinking the worst, like, uh, and having a, a sense of pressure about it. And that then translated into enormous anxiety really on everyone, parent, child, educator alike. And so this pre-existed COVID and then COVID ratcheted up obviously um, and revealed many inequities in our society that were pre-existing, but to some degree hidden um, in terms of economic inequities, healthcare inequities, racial discrimination and inequities, 
um, and minority uh, disadvantages. So this awareness, climate change, like has, you know, even the last couple of years with wildfires out west and storms um, has, has really been a revealing of things that were pre-existing, but we're now aware of in a different way, which gives us an opportunity to face that challenge, but also can be overwhelming. In the next slide, part of what we wanna talk about is the fatigue that can occur when we are overwhelmed. With COVID, with, so the fatigue pre-existed COVID, but COVID had this extra layer, obviously, of health, health care. What, I mean, it was only a year ago that we were, you know, washing our hands so many times a day, which, by the way, I never caught a cold during that time. Um, but it was also, should I touch a, a package? What's safe? What isn't safe? So there was just, just unbelievable uncertainty uh, even a year ago. And now there's much more certainty about what we can do to be safe and practice safely. So to an extent, tolerating uncertainty promoted resilience because how people tolerated the uncertainty around their health at least those who did well and remained healthy, it was by practicing uncertainty and vigilance. But that level of vigilance was exhausting to people. And so when Tony and I were first doing these slides, we were really talking about how youth, as demands went up, you know, they became more and more and more, you know, irritable and burned out. And the demands of that era were the demands for academic excellence and, and high functioning and getting to the best college. Uh, what, if we look at this slide today, how I think of it now is that well, COVID introduced an unprecedented level of boredom and frustration that's on the far left. And I think when I think about like the population of, you know, teens and young adults I've seen and then their parents, I would say the teens operated more in I'm bored out of my mind and I can't stand online school. I'm frustrated, I wanna see my friends. They had a lot of social distress that way. And they were stimulation seeking, which sometimes backfired in like taking too many risks and taking healthcare risks that it, adults were upset about. On the right hand side, the parents, I would say, were heavily representative of the right-hand side of this curve. They were totally overloaded by demands to both work remotely and be their child's remote teacher if they needed to. What was the assignment of the day? Are you on? I had so many sessions interrupted by kids going, I can't get my camera to work, you know, and a parent would get up, go fix the camera. Um, are you on this line? Which class are you supposed to be on? So this was happening live in a way it never had. And we certainly read about more and more and more mothers who either left their jobs, couldn't do their jobs remotely because they were also double duty with their, you know, basically managing their children's uh, schoolwork. So parents, I think on the right side of this curve, Usually it's one individual on this curve and where are they? But we saw it as a society, I think this year, parents were on the right side of the curve, totally overloaded, incredibly irritable, often with each other. Um, and, and, and what resulted, if you look at both sides that, of the spectrums that the kids and the parents occupied is everyone got burned out. Everyone was like, oh, get me out of this. And there was a sense of, you know, we were running a marathon, but the markers kept moving. We had no idea when the marathon would be over. Um, and if we used, you know, the, the Black Death of the 13th century as any marker, it was gonna take at least two years. Um, and we could, we could lose an enormous part of the, the world population. And sadly, of course, some of that is still happening. So we were incredibly fortunate to have science produce a vaccine in unbelievable record time. However, it's left most people exhausted, deeply tired, and trying to manage to remain resilient, whatever, you know, 
that means. It means different things for different people. Sometimes it's just what you do to relax and make the world go away, watch a movie. I weed my garden. Um, it's different things just to kind of have a break from the relentlessness of hypervigilance. So Catherine, with the next slide, what I'd also want to remind people is pre-COVID, Gen Z was, the, was more stressed than any of the other generations. This is an American Psychological Association 2019 survey that we're showing you. And on, as we go down the list of well, what were they worried about? They were, they were, so when you look at the first figure, 75% versus 65%. Gen Z, 75% of them polled said, yes, I'm very, very worried about mass shootings, mass school shootings. They were experiencing it. You know, it was, it was a horrible number um, of mass shootings. And basically within the first month of, of the country being open, we began to see mass shootings happen again. So the 75% versus 65%, 65% represents the, the highest level report from any of the other generations. In order, if we look at the order of generational distress before COVID, it was Gen Z was the most distressed, then the millennial generation was next, then their parents, um, Gen Xers uh, were, were next. Boomers were doing really well, like, hey, no worries. Like, you know, I've gotten this far and maybe I'll even get to retire. And then the, great, the greatest generation as they're called uh, was also like in really good shape. They weren't worried at, at this level. So Gen Z was also, so 2019, as you remember, enormous deportation of immigrants, breaking up of their families. This was also the hashtag Me Too, um, you know, era. It still is, but I mean, it was prominent in 2019. 2019 was also the year before we had a presidential election. Um, so there's enormous amount of fear about what would happen to the country and the country was so polarized. Fear to poor mental health, 27% of Gen Z reported that versus 13% of their parents reported that. Personal debt, Gen Z was actually quite worried about personal debt and housing instability. And now it's gotten worse because of COVID. So not for everyone, but for certain segments of our society. So Tony is gonna to take over from here in terms of talking, walking you through some of the statistics that have occurred um, with COVID in terms of uh, the stressors both parents and teenagers have been experiencing. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, you know, there is now, you know, data to show <clears throat> that the for the for the Gen Z teens, that over half of them say that the pandemic has made planning for their future feel impossible, and that uh, that it's actually not just planning for the future, but has actually disrupted their plans for the future. I mean, if you stop to think about it, teenagers, if anything, should be feeling really excited and looking forward to what's going to come down the road and getting ready for college and thinking about future careers, <clears throat> and what we're seeing is a large number are reporting this sense that, you know, this future of mine is not only hard to plan for, it, it actually has, it, it, it's really, this has disrupted everything for me. Now, why is that? Okay, we could look at a number of factors. Number one, that the pandemic itself is so unpredictable, and its ebbs and flows have really been you know the, the the surges and then the re and then the surge again and then relaxing. I mean, you know, we could say even though this was done earlier on in the pandemic, um, I would suspect that if we went back to talk to teens now, these numbers actually might be worse because we've seen both the the, you know, the resurgence in certain sectors of the United States now with the with the variant um, and the Delta variant and the as as you as B just mentioned mask mandates are coming back. Certain states are actually experiencing major, major surges. So that's one factor, the, the, the impact of the, of the pandemic just on everyone. Secondly, is how disrupted schools have been. And I can't say enough how no one was, not only not, were, were people not prepared 
for the pandemic in terms of responding to it from the standpoint of public health, but our, our educational systems were really thrown out of whack and kids felt that. Kids have felt throughout this whole time that they're not learning as much. There's evidence to suggest that academic performance has gone down, especially in those with less access to, you know, to, re to schools. And, but, but even in, in, in high performing, high achieving schools, which we now understand to be places of tremendous stress. And we can talk about that a little bit later in the Q&A, but um, this, this, I think, these data here reflect an altered landscape for, for teenagers um, that we have to address, all of us, parents, teachers, mental health professionals, community leaders, because it's not gonna suddenly vanish as people start to emerge from this summer and go back to school. There will be great things about being back in school, but there's also a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anxiety about that. And finally, I'd say the last thing about this fear of the future has to do with even before the pandemic, a sense that the United States in the world is now in a different place and you know, how solid is the economy going to be? How good will jobs be? What about globalization? Will, what will that mean for young people's abilities to live a life comparable to the ones that, that uh, they, they saw the, you know, the people ahead of them, the generations ahead of them have? So I think this is a very perilous time in the eyes of teenagers, and you can see it in these data. Next slide. Now, this is not just teens, right? We can see that almost eight, almost eight in 10 Americans said that the pandemic was a source of stress in their life, that the pandemic itself um, is a source of stress and that two thirds say that there was an increased amount of stress. And once again, I don't have to, you know, the, the, it, you don't, it's not rocket science. Um, it, it's, it's altered our lives in the ways that B was describing. Um, immeasurably. And we've had to spend a tremendous amount of energy trying to figure out how to keep ourselves going and adjust and adapt constantly to this changing landscape that we find ourselves in. Everything from daily schedules, you know, how will I get my kid ready for school? Can they even attend school? Will their camera be working? Will they be able to stay on, 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 on and learn what they need to learn? Will I be able to do my job? And then, you know, a host of other questions like, well, what about the summer? Like, what am I gonna do this summer? Will my kids be able to go and do the things they want? Last summer was horrible because, you know, the usual activities like camp and, 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 and other, other, other activities for, for kids were thrown off and parents couldn't take the usual trips they wanted to with their kids. So we, we, we see a tremendous disruption in all facets of life. Next. And again, I mentioned this before, but, but you can see how, um, you know, they think that the school year, parents of kids found the school year to be tremendously stressful. Um, and I mean, we can quibble about 65 versus 76%. But look, this is a substantial number of parents experiencing the disruption that I mentioned. Um, and, and even though we, we don't have a slide to describe this, uh, what we also saw is increases in drinking among Americans. Alcohol consumption went up substantially. And I just heard today uh, the sad news that the deaths from opiates has went up to 93,000 in 2020, uh, a huge bump, okay? A 30% increase from the year before. Uh, and we're all going, oh my God, this is like, this is a sign of a society that is stressed out. By the way, it's not unique to the United States. I think every society on the planet right now is on edge uh, because of the pandemic, because of all of the disruptions and all of the suffering that's being widely, um, widely felt. So what, what, what do we do? What, what is the, what's the path out? Um, and next slide. So we're not gonna tell you what, you're gonna, you, what works for you. You're gonna tell us uh, how you've managed 
what you've done to make life both you know less stressful but also fun in the midst of all this because even though we've been emphasizing the stress and the negatives we also see evidence that americans were actually quite resilient so for example the family routine of sitting down and eating believe it or not family meals were uh, were actually being eroded there were fewer and fewer families having meals regularly together prior to the pandemic and one interesting um, change in family life was because people were home more and there was more cooking at home, people started to eat more together as well. So one routine like eating to get preparing meals, eating together and cleaning up, talking, wow, talking together. Um, this was something that I think of as a, as, as a, as a sign of, of, of uh, resilience. Um, and then the other was people started to find ways to do things together in a, in, a, in a COVID safe way. So riding your bike, going for walks. Many of my patients and their families said that, you know, for the longest time, they hadn't gone and done things like go to the park together and just be there in the outdoors. So I think eating right and, and, and having enough exercise is part of, the, uh, part of the, the deal. Setting expectations for those routines, not becoming you know, super, super, uh, you know, perfectionistic about it. But yeah, getting people to wake up at the right time, because that was another thing that happened on the pandemic was sleep cycles shifted, especially in adolescence. They were staying up later and later and waking up later and later. And we don't, I don't have time to show the data, but uh, that's going to have to change when people return to a more, quote, normal, unquote, uh, lifestyle. Next slide. And finally, the challenge here of because we've been spending so much time on screens, I mean, we're on screens right now with you. Screens are what kept us connected through the pandemic. You know, Zoom calls and Zoom classes and, and social media, all of this were incredibly important for managing our social networks and our, our work, you know, and, you know, Far be it from any of us to say, oh, it would have been fine without this stuff. No, I think it really made it much better for all of us that we were able to stay connected. However, there was also a tendency, and I think this we could talk about later, for the screen time to become almost excessive, for people to become to getting Zoom fatigue would be what some people called it. I know at the end of a day of me seeing patients through, through this interface, I'm exhausted. Um, I'm, I, I think that um, for kids who are not particularly uh, sensitive to normal sleep-wake cycles, we heard I've heard stories about parents going to bed and waking up in the middle of the night and seeing at three in the morning their kids still online playing games or doing um, or doing whatever they like to do, watching YouTube, sort of talking and chatting with their friends who were also up all, all hours. Um, and then, of course, as you all know, the, some of these games have role playing games, have people from around the world playing. So, hey, I'm playing this Fortnite with someone from Korea. And, you know, who cares what day or night it is? Because, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. We're all in different time zones. We're going to play this game. So I think the challenge is how to maintain a healthy sleep wake cycle, uh, because as we learn more and more, if the sleep wake cycle is radically disrupted, um, it's hard to have both physical and mental health sustained. So, so I just pose those as a couple of, of ideas and, and B and I have many others, but we don't wanna talk till we're blue in the face here. I think we wanna hear from you and have some questions and answers. Next slide. Oh, okay. I, I have one more slide, but it doesn't matter. It was just saying questions and answers. So we're ready for that. Great. Well. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. I'd like to go into basically what you're talking about through uh, your presentation. The whole idea of trust and what do people believe and what can people kind of hold on to? Now you talked about these things before about you know making meaning and all this, the whole idea of the altered landscape, but what can, what can kids and parents kind of rely on, I guess would be the best, best way to put it. Well, I guess I'll start just by saying, 
trust has to be earned, right? So, you know, one thing that we need to learn to do is to trust ourselves, right? Like that if I'm not feeling okay, that doesn't mean I'm crazy. I, can I express to someone else, hey, I'm feeling unhappy or I'm feeling scared. And then to whom do we say that? Well, hopefully people in our family and our closest friends. And can they respond to us in an understanding empathic way? So I guess trust starts within the family, with ourselves, with the family. And then in terms of who do you trust source-wise out there, I guess that's something that's a lot more complicated, Vanessa, because we see evidence that people are not trusting science, for example. I absolutely agree with you in terms of how um, sad it is, really, that the atomization of our populace has... Um, you know, that even basic health information and scientific information has become politicized and polarized to that extent. But I think if we think about this and what's really encouraging about a good education, whether that's in high school or college or that sort of thing, is that they teach kids how to analyze sources. In fact, they insist on, you know, uh, helping, uh, that's part of the educational model is analyzing sources. Where did this come from? What do we know about it? Why would you believe it? Why wouldn't you believe it? And kids are taught things like, are you looking for confirmation bias? How is, you know, how are you asked to support your position? Are you only looking for information that supports your position? Could you, you know, can you argue it from another perspective? So education inherently, uh, I think one of the, the terrible like underfunded parts of America is how much it's pulled back on, on funding public education, uh, you know, whether it's at a high school community or, or college level, you know, especially those that are public universities, which used to, produce some of the like, you know, really, you know, kind of stars of uh, my generation anyway. Um, but I think beyond that, part of what I would ask people to think about is that we are basically tribal and that has influenced us to like, kind of just stick within our comfort zone of what do you think, what do you think with people we know rather than saying, well, let me listen to people I don't know. Let me try to understand why they believe this or that. And actually the most success that in the psychological field people have had with changing bias is to not just argue with someone, and especially it doesn't work on the internet to just argue the case, um, but to care about tell me more about what you believe and why you believe it. So that the person in essence has to analyze their own and evaluate their own thinking. And I, at a parental level, what I would say to parents here in the audience is that that's a good question to ask your kids. So it's very hard to learn not to just keep giving advice because we think I know more than you and I'm gonna tell you how this works. But to really, if your kids come up with something that you think this is goofy, okay, but you know, ask thoughtful questions about it. Help me understand it. Tell me what, you know, you know, guides your thinking on this. What about that? Like, you know, uh, kind of what about that is popular within the- I mean, I, 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 follow. one more thing that I, I emphasize this, conversations with each other, kids with, parents and parents with one another and parents with teachers. I mean, how do we restore trust in our public institutions is what I'm really most concerned about. Trust in, 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 in you know, everything from voting to education to, you know, um, the, the sources of information from like the CDC. And, and we know in the case of the, of the early days of the pandemic, Americans lost a lot of faith in the sources of, of, their, of the news because A, they were told this wasn't a big deal, all right, when it was. And the CDC, its first tests were flawed, okay? And if you're basing, you know, rates of infection on a test that's contaminated, you know, you're losing ground there. And so everybody's got to acknowledge then in order to maintain trust is, hey, I made a mistake. 
And that, uh, and to me, that's how you gain trust back if, if the things you've said turn out not to be true. Like if I say something to someone and it turned out to be false, and not because I was lying, but because I was wrong or I didn't understand something, I have to own it. I have to say, well, I made a mistake and you know, this is important so that we can maintain a trusting relationship. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I just want to add to that a little bit. So there's the societal and institutional level, but I would also say to parents, um, it's important if we want our kids to own up to things, we have to own up to things too. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake. I'm sorry. Uh, here's what was going on. Da da da. Um, um, I did that really, really often. It made it easier for my kids to own up to their mistakes. And so I'd say, be a role model in that way. Um, you know, and and it's humbling in in a sense just to recognize, okay, like that is tolerating uncertainty. Like I think it's this, but I could be wrong. You know, I'll let you know when I find out more. So that's that's a baseline establishing of a of an aspect of social maturity that Tony often talks about in terms of one of the um, ways the um, maturity aspects of being ready for, uh, you know, success in life in a way. I know there might be other questions, but I want to reflect on back on the other point here. You know, nowadays, sources of information are no longer given from older generation to younger generation. If anything, kids probably have more access to internet and other sources of information, at least faster access than their parents do, because they're digital natives. So one important question would be to just open it up and say, so what do you think of X? And if people have an opinion, it's like, well, where did that opinion come from? And just to inquire, like B was saying, oh, you read it on your Facebook posting? Ah, okay. Well, did you know that a lot of the news that's, that's being you know, put on Facebook isn't necessarily accurate? So let's go see if we can find another source to validate that, okay? And if there's more validation from other sources, fine. If not, we have to ask ourselves, maybe this is a made up story, which people are really good at. You know, a lot of people believing in something that is quite clearly, um, you know, fiction, but hear the same thing over and over again, hear a lie over and over again, you start to believe it. There's a lot of there's a lot of stories, a lot of misinformation, exactly. But Correct. and 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 yeah. you're answering that in this. It's about interpersonal relationships. It's about everything. It's about misinformation. It's about social media. It's about the overuse of everything. So let me ask a question. Going into this is um, from an audience member this uh, sent to me. So for example, now we're going into the second year. So people have been through this. So what what kinds of conversations are going to be new? and maybe differently charged than they were year one? Because this is, the, everybody's been through this, but this is different now. What, what do you suggest parents and kids ask one another, talk about differently, look at differently? Well, there's gonna be re-entry in a way that there wasn't any re-entry in the past year. Um, and or, so or timing re entry, there was a tense yeah. re entry that. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, so yes, thank you. Um, so, so some of the re entry is whether you know, if you're a kid, it's like, oh, I get to go to school full time as opposed to one day a week or two days a week or that sort of thing. Um, so part of it is just the re entry conversations and the anxiety around re entry because we could say, oh, that's a wonderful thing. But it also brings up, um, you know, kids are out of practice, whether it's the, the sleep wake cycle or also, you know, some kids truly, truly preferred being remote because they, they weren't picked on. And, you know, there is some correlation, a quite high correlation between if you're picked on at school, you're also picked up on online. But at least they were not picked on half the time, you know? So some kids preferred the online life and now they have to go back and they may or may not want that or like that. Um, uh, so I think that those are some of the talking points, I think the others will be how long do the vaccinations last? So some of it will still be, I think, very health focused. Well, how about, the, let, me, let me just play off the one thing you just said. So yeah. it starts with a conversation. What do you imagine it's gonna be like to go yeah. back to school? Exactly. What are you looking forward to? What are you afraid of? How, right. can you, how can we help you deal with what you're afraid of? 
yeah. or what what might you not like? <laughs> you may not be afraid of it, but you might like, like for example, I'm not gonna lie having to get up at seven o'clock again or 6.30, cause it was fine to roll out of bed at 8.30 and be in class at nine, you know? Now I have to get up at seven or six. So yeah, we're gonna have to make some adjustments, right? And I do think that changing back, re-entering is not just going back to what was. So the other piece is that we might call it re-entry, but the reality is a new reality. So it's not gonna feel the same. It's gonna feel strange. It's gonna feel in some ways good, but in some ways it's gonna be odd. And I remember this just not like two months ago, first time my wife and I went out to dinner in a restaurant, first time in a long time. It felt weird. It felt nice to be out, but eh, it was a little uncomfortable. And you know, when and how do you wear the mask? What do you do? So I just think normalizing the notion that reentry is not just, oh, drop in, everything's fine, but rather, Drop in, see what's going on. What's what is it like? Is it is it is it is it the way you expect it? If not, why not? Once you get there, and I do think that what B was getting at, which is, we don't know how much the virus is coming back in the fall, and whether we're going to have to re, you know, regroup and go back into our caves. And I think that that's a very scary thought for people right now. So if you ask me, what's the biggest fear I have? Is the fear that the pandemic is gonna surge back and that people are really gonna have a harder time this time around. Even though we know what we need to do, the motivation's gonna be different because we're not gonna be motivated the same way we were the first time. It's gonna feel a lot worse since we've gotta do the same old thing again. So that's, I think, part of the conversation is how do you stay healthy and how do you try to guarantee that the surge isn't back? you know, that, that, it, that COVID doesn't surge back. So just to add to what Tony's saying in that conversational, like hypothetical, um, one, of the, one of the dilemmas that um, I think parents face that seems very benign and is tricky is overly reassuring, bright-siding, uh, you know, oh, don't worry about that, or uh, like, no, nah, that won't be a problem. Um, because if, if your child, however old your child is, you know, from like ch childhood to like teenage to young adult, uh, has a concern or has an anxiety and you've asked them, like, or maybe they've just volunteered, if you want them to keep talking with you, you take it seriously. Thank you for telling me, I hadn't thought of that huh, what do you think? So again, it's getting out of the parental advice giving mode or like, because how a kid's gonna hear that, like, oh, don't worry about it, is we're not gonna talk about it. That's the end of the conversation. And that's not what you want as a parent. You want a kid to keep talking, even if what they're saying is kind of distressing to you. And one of our kind of mantras is to parents, it's like manage your own anxiety first, and then your kid will be better off. Yes, it's like the oxygen mask. Put it on you and then get the other mask and give it to your kid. Right. Uh, the one other thing that I think, parent, speaking about reentry, is I think parents have to also think about and discuss their own fear of reentry wherever they have to reenter. Because it may actually end up being easier for kids because kids have an automatic peer group that they're going back to. So they're going to look forward to that, right? The biggest loss for kids was the loss of their social connections and their you know, hanging out in the cafeteria, after school, going to each other's houses, sports teams, all of that. So the, re, the rebirth of those things, I think for the majority will feel very reassuring, very, very much, you know, resilience promoting. But what about parents? Well, what's gonna happen going back to the workplace? Or if you're not going back to the workplace and you're gonna work from home, how's that gonna be for you um, in, this, in, this, in this transition? May I ask you, what are you hearing from parents when they're talking, when they're talking about their issues first? What are their issues before the kids even get into the mix? Well, one, one issue they I've heard a lot about is, ha have I gained too much weight? Do I need to lose weight? You know, now that was a joke, but it's true. People are feeling like I have not been out in a long time in, you know, uh, the work setting. Um, I just think parents mostly are worried about the, will the pandemic come back or not? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, what I'm hearing is a variation on that, which is 
my employer is not requiring vaccinations. Uh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable going into that setting because like I've been very vigilant or I have an older family member at home, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable going back. And I've also heard business owners who own independent businesses be very loath to tell their employees who do not want to get vaccinated that they can't come in. And I just think, oh, we're in trouble here. <laughs> uh, they're also, yeah, there are gonna be, I, I have heard the other fear from parents, like you said, B, and mm -hmm. I don't know if employers, they're of two minds, right? Because they don't want to lose employees right. by insisting everybody has to be vaccinated. Right. But if they don't insist everybody's vaccinated, then they're going to have are gonna, So it's like, if you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, and it's so interesting with schools where you have some schools, you have to be vaccinated, other schools, it's, yeah. and so in a school that where it's, where it's um, variable, I would think there's a lot of trust issues with people who have been vaccinated saying, I wonder who's vaccinated here. I wonder what's happening. So it's it's just such an interesting landscape. I want to ask you um, one last question, if that's all right. Talk, I mean, and, and I'd like to ask you to talk about anything you'd like to talk about, but the whole idea of this really altered landscape. Again, what are you hear what are you hearing from your patients and families you're dealing with about the main the main topics, the main issues, the main, the main change, the big change. I've heard a lot of families who've had their children who are young adult children return home and how sometimes that has been something they've been very kind of glad to incorporate, want to be helpful. I've also seen um, um, family situations where uh, one parent, and sometimes it's a step parent, sometimes it's a biological parent, uh, just feel like get on with it. And so parents have become more polarized in terms of parental issues, partly because their own expectations for the certainty of, I thought we were done raising children. <laughs> it's kind of like, hi, hello. Um, not sure that that has a time stamp on it. Um, but a lot of families reincorporated their children for lots of different reasons. And of course, we read a lot of stories where that was, you know, had a really positive outcome. But I've also seen families where, you know, it almost split up marriages and it, it was tricky. It was tricky. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say, Vanessa, I'll say there's no one answer because my patients are so varied. For the group that are in some way developmentally challenged, have learning issues, uh, ADHD or autism spectrum, it has been horrible to try to have them learn or go, and have no access to in-person, um, not only learning, but social skills groups and supports. And for the more afflicted to not be able to go to a, a program during the day. So the parents have, are just plain over, just they're over it. They can't wait for these programs to open up again. Now it's different from state to state. Uh, New Jersey's programs have opened up sooner than Pennsylvania's. I don't know what it's like in Connecticut. But um, so one group of parents are just simply saying, I cannot wait for the schools or and or the programs and the after school programs and everything to open up again, because I have been working overtime. This is not, I've been more than just a parent. I've been a teacher. I've been a counselor. I've been a, you know, uh, a, a 24 seven. Uh, and I think, you know, this is this. So what they're afraid of is that there's going to be a backslide again. OK, now the other the other thing I'm hearing from the kind of the parents of of these kids going off to college is that they feel awful for the kids who feel unprepared right now, especially seniors who are starting as freshmen next year. You know, if you poll most American high school seniors who are about to start college, I mean, what I'm hearing from other colleagues and other uh, college counseling programs is tremendous anxiety about will I be able to make it in school? So whereas our, 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 the book, The Stressed Years, talked a lot about this natural anxiety that's been growing over years and years in America about will I make it in school? Well, this entering freshman class, on the one hand, they've had the benefit of of saying, well, we're all in this together, right? None of us really 
had the best high school senior year because of the pandemic. But I do think that they're afraid that they don't have the academic skills they need. They may not have had enough time, you know, learning and buffing some of their writing skills and analytic skills. And the one, the one that the, the skills that B was referring to is the self-management skills, you know, being in charge of your day and managing from the minute you get up to the minute you go to bed, that hasn't happened either because everybody's been on top of each other. So I just think that um, for that group, I'm talking to them already this and, and have been in the spring into the summer is how do you prepare yourself? Well, you talk to other people you're gonna to go to school with, you begin to figure out who your roommate is, you start to like look at your classes and talk with other people who are going to all say the same thing is, well, time to go back to college and this is, the, this is it. I think colleges are really gonna try very, very hard to, to normalize the abnormality of not of being back in school <laughs> and, and, and to do it with, you know, a lot of, with trying to, they're gonna spend much more time socializing kids to, into school than they normally do. Yeah. A lot more effort during orientation to get people comfortable, to talk about the virus and what you need to do to, to talk to parents about what's going I just think that things are gonna be even with all the anxiety, I do think the schools are, are, are coming on with, with, with uh, additional um, efforts at orienting people. Yeah, and, and emphasizing emotional intelligence. Exa and, and emphasizing emotional intelligence and social connectedness. Right, mm -hmm. right. And there was one thing that from those that were away in school and doing all the line, online learning, there were some breakthrough moments for them even though they knew they weren't really meeting the people and having the fun experience. So the ones who were the saddest, so the ones who were most anxious are the ones entering this coming yes. year. The ones who were saddest were the freshmen who felt yeah. like crap. I have not had a normal freshman year. I've been robbed. But one thing that I heard is that because they're so adept at their social media stuff is that they began to meet each other uh, and, and meet after class. And they began to have little conversations in their small groups and say things like, hey, you wanna meet up later as though they were going to go for coffee and they weren't, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. So they, they, found, they found ways to make friends these, yeah. these freshmen. And there, uh, there are positives and silver linings to oh, everything. I think, but... Gen Z, I think Gen Z, despite all the anxiety they're feeling, they're also feeling like we got to start taking care of ourselves and the world. I think yeah, they're just yeah. how things are yeah. screwed up, and how screwed a... up things are, and they want to make a change. If, if I'm going to predict anything about the Gen Z generation is that they are not going to sit back and let things happen. They are going to be very, very in your face, in your face. This has to change. We can't accept this anymore. That's, that's my hope. It's fantastic. What? Anything else you want to say? I mean, that's a great way to end. But anything else you want to add? This has been fantastic. What else? Your parting. Your parting words. You know, I would just encourage um, parents and kids alike to um, recognize that uncertainty has always been a part of life. Life is very curvy. It's not linear. We think we plan and it doesn't turn out as we hope. And, you know, and just to learn that like, well, that's, that's just human. That's just part, that's just part of, of, of our lives now. And it has been, it's just that we had the illusion that it wasn't. Yeah. And I'd say learn skills like mindfulness and, and trying yeah. to break out of habit loops that aren't good for you. You know, start to, if you're overeating, eat slower. Look at why are you doing the things you're doing? Ask yourself, am I really need to do X or Y that's not good for me? So that we can, you know, I think both parents and kids, um, you know, I think we're, we're in a sense, we're such, we're so hyper vigilant right now that it puts, puts us in a situation where we're not even aware that we're hyper vigilant. Like we've almost become uh, adapted to an abnormal sense of constantly having to check and recheck and recheck. So I would hope that, you know, once you've got the right amount of hand washing or keeping distance that you can enjoy and start to get outside of that hypervigilant state and begin to learn to relax again. And I think 
whatever gets people to relax. For some people, it's mindfulness. For others, it's rock climbing. For others, it's listening to music or all of the above. Uh, and, and I do think that the, the pandemic did help people start to learn to um, find ways to do that. Um, and for some to pr prioritize what's really important, to really make sure that you do yeah. what's important and do it first. Yep, it's been an existential yeah. time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this. And I know Catherine's going to come on, on and Dan's going to come on, but thank you so much for your great to be here. Incredible words, yeah. incredible words. And their next book, I'm going to put a plug in for them. Their next book is, is Being Born As We Speak. It's on its way. We'll be sure to tell everybody about it. But thank you. And Catherine and Dan are going to conclude. But thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yes, just to piggyback on that, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I, as a parent myself, learned a lot of new things. So I really do appreciate it. And thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. And we did record, so uh, we will share the recording. If anybody care, wants to share it with other people or to reference it or uh, whatever you'd like, we will put it up um, on the, uh, the Playhouse YouTube channel uh, and you'll be able to access it there. And we will also email it out to all of the registrants tonight. Right. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you so much. Night. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.